So yes, good morning again. We're starting our class for this Monday. It's October 11th. And uh, we're looking at the life of Christ some more through the Gospels. Let's pray. Father, Father in heaven, we come before you this morning with hearts filled with thanksgiving for all that you have done for us. We're thankful for these scriptures, which you have given to us to reveal yourself to us, to edify us, to give us life, Lord. We pray that we receive life today as we learn about the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and his time here on this planet, his ministry to people, his message of the gospel, his love expressed, the hope that he gave, the grace that he showed. Lord, build us up and edify us today as we gather here together in one spirit and one body to hear the one message, the one message, the one truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let us share the screen here. Here we are. Here we are. Class number 11. And we're starting a new period, okay? This is called Jesus's final days in Jerusalem. Okay, we were talking about his third year, but now we're starting on a more focused period of time, his final days in Jerusalem. So we have a bit of an introduction here. Um, Jesus left Jericho. Remember, we were in Jericho where he healed blind Bartimaeus where he saw Zacchaeus up in the tree and he went to his house and Zacchaeus was gloriously saved and started paying back everybody all the money that he had cheated them out of and even more. So Jesus left Jericho and went to Bethany, which was about two miles or about a little over three kilometers east of Jerusalem. And this was six days before the Passover, according to John 12.1. Jesus probably stayed with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha while he waited for the Passover festival to begin. He knew those people. They were his friends. They lived in Bethany. So it's most likely that he stayed in their home. The events between Jesus' arrival in Bethany and his death and resurrection occurred in just a few days, within a few days. But the gospel writers devoted about one third of their total writing to those days. So we're talking about like a, a one week period, but the gospels give one third of all of their time, all their writing to this one week period of Jesus's life. It's very important. So this, we're going to look at Mary's anointing of Jesus. While Mary was in the home of Lazarus, Mary poured an expensive perfume on his feet and wiped his feet, wiped them with her hair. Now, it was unthinkable at this time that a woman would use her crowning glory, like her hair, to wipe someone's feet. Okay, because the, the top of the body, the head, was considered to be, you know, the, the most glorious part. It's the part that's actually closest to heaven when you think about it. Whereas the feet are the part of the body that is the dirtiest, and it's the lowest part of the body, the part that's furthest away. It is the part that is considered to be the, the least beautiful, the least glorious. And so she's using her hair which is her glory on her head to wipe someone's feet, the lowest part of the body. And this is an act of great humility on Mary's part. This humble act showed Mary's love for Jesus, that she would make this great sacrifice, this expensive perfume. And then also, you know, this, the sacrifice of, I don't know, her reputation or her 
her dignity or whatever you want to call that, that she would make herself do this. You know, this showed her great love for Jesus. But Judas criticized Mary, saying that the perfume could have been sold to feed the poor. Like he did not see the love. He did not see the humility at all. He did not see the significance of this. All he thought about was, how much does that perfume cost? We, we, we could have sold that. We could have gotten money for that. And uh, we could have fed the poor with that money. Hmm. But Jesus considered Mary's display of love and respect as an anointing for his burial, which he knew would be within a few days. While this anointing was happening, a large crowd gathered outside the house, hoping to see Jesus and Lazarus, since the resurrection of Lazarus had happened only days before. So Jesus and Lazarus together again in the same place was quite a spectacle. Jesus had raised his friend Lazarus from the dead just a few days before this. And so, you know, people wanted to see them together. They were kind of a little bit celebrated or celebrities. And meanwhile, the smell of the perfume, this strong smell of this perfume is probably going out the doors and out the windows and the people outside can smell it. Well, there are some people out there who were not happy, <laughs> and they were the chief priests. They were infuriated because these people who were all excited to see Jesus and Lazarus were also proclaiming Jesus to be a great prophet. And the chief priests were not happy about this. They wanted Jesus to be arrested and executed. Remember, they've had a plan for quite some time to do away with Jesus. They want him dead. He's too dangerous to be alive. They're calling Jesus a great prophet. He is drawing all the attention to himself. They are kind of being left out. Jesus rides on a donkey. The time arrived for Jesus to finally reveal himself to the crowds that had gathered in Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And Jesus chose to do this by making a triumphal entry into the city. Why is it called the triumphal entry? Uh, it's because of the, what, how the people treated Jesus when he entered. We'll see this in just a second. Like the people were expecting Jesus as a Messiah to be a conquering general coming in on a white horse. Okay, this is what conquering generals did when they had defeated their en enemies. They held, they held a parade. It was called a triumph. And they were expecting Jesus to come in on a white horse, like a general or a conquering king coming into the city. But Jesus was riding on the back of a donkey. And Jesus did this as the fulfillment of the prophecy in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which says, Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, but he's also lowly and riding on a donkey. A king, a lowly king. Isn't that interesting? A lowly king who is just and he is bringing salvation. So instead of riding on a white horse like a conquering general, he is riding on a humble donkey. The prophecy that we just read indicated that the Messiah was not a military deliverer but he was a spiritual servant king whose mission was to set the people free from their bondage to sin. Okay, he came with salvation, right? Now, some people, a lot of people, missed the message that Jesus tried to send. So what they did was they, 
they took their robes and they took palm branches from the trees and they put them in the path of the donkey where Jesus was riding on. And this was a gesture of honor for a conquering king. When, when a general had a triumphal entry, you know, coming in after defeating the enemies, maybe sometimes leading a whole processional of his soldiers and all the people that they have captured in the war, or the battle, people would put things down in the roadway for the conqueror to ride upon on his white horse. Well, Jesus wasn't riding a white horse. He was riding a donkey, but they still treated him as though he was this great conqueror. Maybe they anticipated that he would conquer their enemies. And then they started shouting out to him, Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, like, woohoo, hooray, the conqueror has come. He's come to save us. He's come to rescue us from, from the Romans. And that last sentence says, the people welcomed Jesus as the king that they wanted. They were treating Jesus in the way that they wanted him to be. They wanted him to be a conquering king. That is all they could imagine the Messiah to be. That is all they thought of. You know, even though Jesus had spent, you know, years preaching repentance, preaching the gospel, preaching salvation, when <laughs> They, they really didn't hear what he had to say. Most of them did not hear that. They just heard like salvation. Oh, that means deliverance from the Roman government. And so they're saying, yes, the son of David, the great king, our, a new king has come, the Messiah has come, and he is going to rescue us. You know, that's 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 a problem that we all have at times is that sometimes we we see what we want to see and we hear what we want to hear instead of what God is trying to show us and what God is trying to tell us. So we have to we have to prepare our hearts. We have to prepare our hearts when we're when we're listening to or reading the word of God, that we're not just seeing what we want to see and hearing what we want to hear, but actually hearing what the Holy Spirit wants to tell us, what, seeing what he wants to show us. So Jesus arrives in the city and he goes to the temple. He arrives there and he sees merchants selling sacrificial animals in the temple's outer courtyard. He also sees others exchanging foreign coins for the coins that are needed to pay the annual temple tax. This is all in Matthew 21. And Jesus became so angry at this. He overturned the tables of the money changers. He drove away the merchants. And Jesus said that these commercial activities were turning the Lord's house of prayer into a den of thieves. You know, people were robbing people, overcharging people, for the animals, overcharging people for, you know, for the coins that they need to pay the annual temple tax. They were making a profit out of the worship of God. This did not make Jesus happy. And, and the fact that they were doing it in the temple, like the outer courtyard of the temple, did not make him happy at all. So he overturned the tables and drove them out. <sighs> So that's what he did on the first day that he arrived in Jerusalem. So he goes home to Bethany that night and he returns the next day to Jerusalem. And on the way, he sees a fig tree that contains no figs. And he curses the tree because it has no fruit. And he says, that tree will never bear fruit again. Well, the, the fig tree is one of the trees that represents Israel. You know, and God had blessed the Jews as his chosen people for over a thousand years. And they had had the potential to bear fruit for him, but had repeatedly 
they had failed to do so. We see it in the Old Testament, right? You know, they, they, had, they had a problem with God right from the beginning. And remember, they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years. And, most, and they all died except for the ones that were below a certain age. And then after they conquered the, the promised land and received it, they fell into sin and into idolatry. And we have the period of the judges where they just kept getting overtaken by all the other people around them. Instead of being an influence on those people to show God to them, to share the message of the Bible with them and revealing God to them, instead, the gods of those other peoples influenced the people of Israel, and they fell into sin. And then Samuel comes along and tries to straighten everybody out, and they ask for a king. We have the period of the kings where it's glorious, and David is the king, and Solomon and all of his glory. But then after that, there's this decline, and they go off into idolatry again. And they end up being divided and taken away into captivity and exile. They had, God had given them many opportunities. He had blessed them so much. They had potential to bear fruit for him, but they failed to do so again and again. And because of their failure and their rejection of Jesus, here's God again, here's God again, giving them an opportunity to get to know him, to serve him, to obey him, to love him. God himself comes and they're rejecting God himself in the person of Jesus. And now Jesus is saying to them that the Jews are going to suffer the Lord's judgment. And he exemplifies this by cursing the fig tree. There were some Greeks who asked to see Jesus. Philip and Andrew told Jesus that a group of Greeks wanted to talk to him. These are Gentiles. These Greeks were probably God-fearers. They were Gentiles who were attracted to Judaism because of its ethical and moral standards, something that you did not find in, in, the, in the Greek religion. They probably wanted to hear what Jesus had to say about the Old Testament, so they wanted to see Jesus. Now, this request started Jesus talking about his approaching death and his mission in the world. That's in John chapter 12. Okay. Through these Greeks, Jesus saw a future where people of all races would respond to the gospel and become citizens of the kingdom of God. So Jesus is talking about a future time after his death where Greeks or Gentiles would be responding to the gospel. So before Remember, he, he cursed the fig tree and he said, you know, you Jews, you're rejecting the gospel, but in the future, the Gentiles are going to gladly receive the gospel. They're going to want this message. You're rejecting me and you're rejecting my message, but the Gentiles will receive the message. But, be, you know, so there's, <laughs> there's the time in between though, right? Here's the Jews rejecting. Here's the Gentiles receiving. But in between, what has to happen? Jesus realizes the price that he has to pay for this vision to become a reality. He has to die to be the Savior. And only by choosing to give up his own life could he give life, eternal life, to believers, both the Jews and the non-Jews. Not all Jews rejected Jesus. I mean, we know that 3,000 of them became Christians on the day of Pentecost, and many more were added to the church daily. Many Jews did become, become Christians, but like the, the Jewish intellectuals, the Jewish religious class of people, the rich people who thought that they did not need God because they, they were blessed with riches, they rejected Christ, and they were the ones that contributed to his crucifixion on the cross. And they were the ones that were in charge of leading the people and teaching the people. And so they were the ones that were 
being cursed like the fig tree was being cursed. Now, as Jesus is speaking these things out loud and talking to these people, a voice from heaven spoke and confirmed Jesus's commitment to go to the cross. Let's go and let's look at John chapter 12 here. John chapter 12. So Jesus is predicting his death on the cross. And in verse 27, it says, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this purpose, I came to this hour. Okay, so he knows he has to go to the cross. He knows he's going to die soon. And he says, Father, in verse 28, glorify your name. Like, God, you be glorified in what I'm about to do. And it says, then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So a voice speaks from heaven. This is the voice of God. And this is the third time in Jesus's ministry when the Father speaks in an audible voice that all can hear. The first time was at Jesus's baptism. Remember, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then at his transfiguration with Peter, James, and John. When, when the voice from heaven says, this is my son, Jesus, hear ye him, hear him, listen to him. And here again, in John chapter 12, a voice from heaven says, I have both glorified it, meaning his name, and I will glorify it again. It's like the father saying, amen to Jesus's words. So this is, this is, can you imagine that, hearing the voice of God from heaven? And then three times they heard it. The disciples, at least Peter, James, and John, heard it three times. <laughs> In this same passage, Jesus says that he would be lifted up. That's in verse 32. And, it, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. He will be lifted up, okay? He, he is literally going to be lifted up onto the cross. And this will draw people to him. And this would also mark Satan's defeat. Satan was defeated at the cross. The religious leaders are still coming after Jesus. They're angry about what he did on that first day when he came into the temple and drove out all the money changers and the, those that were selling the animals. They demanded that Jesus tell them by what authority he had cleansed the temple. And the reason for this was because they were responsible for its operation. The religious leaders, they must have been receiving maybe a little bit of money by allowing these animal sellers and these money changers to use the temple outer courtyard of the temple. So they're not up they're, they're upset with Jesus, probably because they're losing money from this. So, Jesus, what is your authority? Jesus answered their question with his own question. Where did John's baptism come from? From heaven or from men? Now, this caused a dilemma, a problem for the religious leaders. You know, if we answer this way, it's a problem. If we answer this way, it's a problem. There seems to be no good solution. If they said that John's ministry was authorized by heaven, they would have admitted that they had resisted God by refusing to re accept John's message. That would make them look bad. If it was John's ministry, they had resisted God, and they were supposed to be God's representatives. 
If they said that John's ministry was not authorized by God, if it had been authorized by men, then this would offend the common people who greatly admired John. Okay, so they didn't want to lose their popularity. So they did not answer the question. We, we don't know. They said, but is that what they said? We don't know. <laughs> and so Jesus said, well, I'm not going to answer your question. If you can't answer my question, then I, I don't feel like I have to answer your question. I don't have to reveal to you the source of my authority. I think Jesus knew it was very obvious where his authority came from, but they did not want to say that. So Jesus takes this as an opportunity to tell a parable. It's a parable about two sons. And one son refused his father's request to work in the family vineyard. But later on, he changes his mind and he does work in the family vineyard. The other son says, oh, yes, yes, I agree. I'll work in the vineyard. But he never followed through on his promise. He never showed up. He never did. And then this first son, the son who refused at first, but then did come and work for his father, he represented the sinners who were far from God, but heard John preach, and then they repented. Like, we, we don't, you know, we're going to do our own thing. We're going to live our own lives. We're not going to respond to the word of God. We're not going to do it. But then they heard John's preaching, and they repented, and they returned to the Lord. And these are some of the same people who are following after Jesus. The second son represented the religious leaders who swore that they would do God's work. But then when they heard John preaching, they refused to believe. Because the message was the message of repentance. They did not want to repent. They did not want to repent. There was no humility in them. They were too proud to repent. And they also did not like the fact that John pointed at Jesus and said that he was the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world, that Jesus was the Messiah. And so, okay, nope, nope, nope. We're not going to listen to John. They had pride. They had pride, pride, pride. Religious pride. And they were not, they were not going to set one foot into the Jordan River to be baptized. Because that would be them admitting that they had something to repent of. And so they had their proud reputation as being holier than anybody else, more righteous than anybody else. And so they were not going to do this. But the sinners, the sinners, they heard the message and they repented gladly and they acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus follows this up with another parable which has an even stronger message for these hypocritical religious leaders. This is a parable about a murdered son. And he tells the story about another vineyard owner who hired some tenants to take care of his property. These are going to be like stewards, people that are going to take care of his land. They can live on the land. They can farm the land. They can make a profit off the land. I mean, they can, they can eat the food from the land, but part of whatever they grow has to be sent to the vineyard owner. That's because it's his land. That's going to be like the payment of their rent was that they send some of the, the fruits of the vineyard to him. Well, harvest time comes. And so the vineyard owner sends his servants 
to claim his portion of the crop. This is what they owe to him because he's letting them use his land. But the tenants refuse to pay what they owe. They're not going to do it in this story. So then the owner says, well, if they're not going to listen to my servant, I will send my son. My son, they will listen to. He will collect my share of the harvest. But the wicked tenants killed the son, and then they dumped his body outside of the vineyard. Remember, Jesus is speaking this directly to the Pharisees and the other religious leaders. The message of this parable was that the Jewish religious leaders would execute Jesus, God's son, when he was sent to call people to repentance and faith. Okay, the son in, this, in the story is Jesus Christ. He came. They wouldn't listen to the servants. They wouldn't listen to the prophets that God had sent before. So God sent his own son. But what would they do? These people who are the tenants in the story, the Jewish religious leaders, they would kill the son. They would kill the son because of his message. What is the message? Repent. Repent and have faith. Repent and believe. But they would not do this. They would not do this. God's purpose could not be stopped, even if they killed the son. If the Jews rejected Jesus and the gospel, God would reach out to the Gentiles, the Gentiles who were eager to hear and believe. Interesting. Jesus then speaks another parable. And this one is about a wedding banquet. It's in Matthew 22. In this parable, a king invites all of his friends to a wedding feast, again, for his son. Okay, this is like God. Please come. Come enter into the kingdom of God. This is in honor of my son. But you know what? They refuse to attend. Refuse to attend. Who do you think these people who are refusing to attend are? Again, the hypocritical Jewish religious crowd who would, would, did not want to hear the message of repentance and faith. So what does the king do? The king invites people from off the streets and from out of the countryside to come and enjoy the meal that he had prepared to honor his son. So these invited wedding guests, they re represented Israel, Israel, God's chosen people that he wanted, he desired for them to come to him, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't listen to Jesus, they wouldn't repent. And so the, these other people that are the people from the streets and from out in the countryside, these are the Gentiles that God would invite to become part of God's family. Now, did these religious leaders understand these parables? Yes, yes. <laughs> the reaction of the religious leaders to this parable and the others about the murdered son demonstrated the truth of its message because they became even more determined to arrest Jesus. They were furious. They were furious. He's talking about us. He's saying that, you know, we are not faithful to God, that we don't listen to God, that we are not godly, that we are not righteous. <laughs> well, they weren't. They weren't. And it was made obvious by the way they reacted to Jesus. No humility. This is like, kill him. Is this is this the re, is this the response of you know a real godly leader? No, this is not representing the heart of God at all. So they wanted to arrest him. They they tried to get people to arrest Jesus, but Jesus had popularity with the people. 
He was surrounded by people. And it made it impossible for the people that they had sent to arrest Jesus to actually carry out the arrest. They just could not do it. It was impossible. Remember, this is all happening within a few days of Jesus' crucifixion. It's very filled with lots of interactions with people. And a lot of times the people that Jesus was interacting with were the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the other Jewish religious folks. So they come to him with a question about taxes. They send, the religious leaders send some Pharisees and some Herodians to ask Jesus a question about paying taxes to the Roman government. And they hoped that Jesus would say something that would lead to his arrest. Like if he said something against Caesar, then maybe the Romans would arrest him as being a traitor or treasonous or seditious, seditious, like somebody who is planning, plotting to overthrow the government. So they came and they asked him this question, was it right or wrong to pay taxes to the Roman government? Now, if Jesus answered yes, a yes answer, that would alienate Jesus from his fellow Jews who all despise the Roman authorities. If Jesus said, yes, of course you should pay taxes, then the Jewish people would be like, ah, we don't, we're not going to listen to you anymore. You support our oppressors. But if Jesus said, no, you should not pay taxes, which is what they were hoping that Jesus would say, that would make Jesus a rebel against Roman authority, and then the Romans would arrest him. But Jesus gave both a yes and a no answer. He had great wisdom. He said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and render to God the things that are God's. <laughs> Jesus was pointing out the difference between the material and the spiritual realms of life. There is the material aspect of life. There is the spiritual aspect of life. He was saying as long as the Romans were the civil authorities, that they had the right to require material taxes from their subjects. You know, Paul writes about this. He says, you know, you know, God has put the authorities in place, and so we should honor the authorities within reason, as long as it's not going against what the Bible clearly teaches. Okay, so honor, honor those in authority over you. God has put them there. So Jesus said, yeah, if they ask you, then you have to do it. But then he's also making a spiritual argument as well. He says, spiritual matters they belong to God alone. And these things can only be rendered to God, like worship and devotion and spiritual loyalty. There is a different, there is like a material aspect of our lives as believers. Like we live in this world. Okay. We have to what? We have to uh, work. We have to work in order to earn money so that we can pay our rent and pay our taxes and buy food and clothes and things like this. To live in this world, we live in a material world. And so there's a material aspect to this part of our lives. We, that's just what it is. But there's a whole other level, this whole other dimension, which is the spiritual realm, the spiritual dimension. Like God is God is reality too. He is the greater reality. He is the eternal reality. And God is all around us. And if we're just going to live in a materialistic, secular world, we're going to be miserable, <laughs> as you can see the world is, because it's being run by a lot of secular materialists. Um, but those of us who honor God, who know God, who love God, who honor and obey God's word, who receive from God, like, you know, okay, there is the material reality, but we realize 
that this is temporal. It's passing away. It's passing away. And we have, we have found something that is greater, something that is lasting, something that gives real joy, real meaning, real purpose to our lives. And it's God himself. And so we, we, if we're going to, we owe God what our worship, our devotion, and our loyalty. And Jesus is pointing this out to these, to these people who don't really know God the way that Jesus knows God. And it's sad because they keep coming after him. And they're, the, all they're concerned about is their little kingdom that they've built here in Jerusalem, in Israel. That all they're concerned with is their power and their money. They're not concerned about the souls of men at all. They're not concerned about the spiritual aspect of people's lives. They're only concerned about themselves. And so they keep coming after Jesus. And so they come and ask him a question about resurrection. And who does this? Sadducees. Sadducees come with a question about the resurrection, and they're hoping that they can trick Jesus and make him look like a fool. But they're the ones that look foolish. The reason is, is because, you know, the Sadducees don't even believe that there is such a thing as resurrection. But they're asking a question about resurrection as if they believed in it. So they're coming up with a hypothetical case, a made up, just imagine Jesus. For example, if there was a woman who was married to seven brothers, one after the other, she married one brother, he died, so she had to marry the next one and so on, all the way down to the seventh brother. And then they asked Jesus, well, you know, in heaven, in the afterlife, you know, which brother is she going to be married to? Which one will be her husband? And they don't even believe that there is an afterlife. They don't believe there's a resurrection. They don't believe there's, that there's a heaven that you go to. They didn't believe in bodily resurrection. So the question was dishonest and hypocritical. But this is, the, this is like the lengths that they will go to to try and destroy Jesus and discredit Jesus. Jesus told the Sadducees that they were judging heavenly matters with earthly logic. So again, Jesus is saying like, God's thoughts are not your thoughts and God's ways are not your ways. God's, God is so much higher. God is concerned about something so much more important than what you think is so important. You are like way down here on the super basic lowest level where all you think about is yourselves, your position, your power, your popularity, your place here on earth, your wealth. And you're not even thinking about the things of God. You don't even know the things of God. You don't even believe that there's, there's, a, there's a, a resurrection, that there's an afterlife. You, you are thinking at such a low level. And so Jesus says, you know, there is an afterlife, yes, but it will be totally different, totally different from what you see around you happening right now, as far as the way that we live and relate to one another. He said, in heaven, we will have richer relationships, better relationships than just, you know, brother and sister and father and child. I mean, this is beautiful for now, but in heaven, you know, it's going to a whole other level. Just like, you know, God's ways and God's thoughts are much higher, better, richer than our ways that we experience right now. He says in heaven, there'll be even richer relationships because we're all going to be members of God's family. And this is something that we can only just barely grasp right now. It's going to be so much better. So are we going to be concerned about who we were married to on the earth? No. Who our father was, who our mother was? No. I mean, yeah, I mean, we'll still know that probably. 
But will that be such a huge issue in heaven? No. The issue in heaven is going to be God. The issue in heaven is going to be Jesus and how we relate to him. And these other things that we think are so important here on the earth, you know, it'll just kind of like, oh, wow. Why did we think that that was such a big deal? Why did, why did we, oh, why did we care about that so much? Why did I grasp and try to hold on to these things? Like people who spent their whole lives trying to accumulate wealth, you know, and then they, they, they die and like, okay, now I, I have no wealth anymore. I have no wealth anymore. And, and you know, and they go to heaven they're, because they're a believer and they're going to look back and think like, why did I spend all my time trying to accumulate more and more and more and more money and houses and lands? And why did I think that was so important? It really wasn't. There are so many things that we think are very, very important. And sometimes we're wrong <laughs> because they're not eternal things. And this is what Jesus is trying to point out here in these last few days that he has with his disciples and in front of the crowds. And even with these, with these religious people who are trying to destroy him, he's trying to show them like, you're so wrong and you're so misguided. I'm trying to tell you the truth. So Jesus has some more harsh words for the Pharisees. It's near the end of his life. And Jesus is not holding back anymore. He issues his severest complaint about the Pharisees and their dangerous doctrines. In Matthew 23, he pronounces a series of woes against them and some of the harshest words that he ever spoke. And one of Jesus's most serious charges against the Pharisees was their emphasis on minor rules in the Old Testament that it increased the burden on the common people. You know, what, what did Jesus say? Like, what are the two greatest commandments? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those were the two major commandments of the Old Testament. And Jesus said, these are the greatest ones. If you do this, you fulfilled all the law. But that's not the way that the Pharisees looked at it. The Pharisees would find these little, small, little, minor rules in the Old Testament and make them the greatest commandments of all. Like, if you don't do this, oh, you're a big sinner. God doesn't want you. God doesn't accept you because you're not doing all these little, little things. You know, and meanwhile, the Pharisees are not loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and they're not loving their neighbors as themselves, the greatest commandments of all. But they're very, very good at keeping all these little, small, little minor rules and making sure that everybody else is doing it or noticing when they're not doing it. And Jesus, whoa, 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 what are you doing? What are you doing? And he's just blasting them with holy, righteous indignation. <laughs> you know, the common people did not have the resources to observe all those little petty regulations that the Pharisees were enforcing. And so Jesus was criticizing them for that and also criticizing their hypocrisy. Again, again, overlooking the two great commandments. And and is what I found. Oh, I don't care. <laughs> My watch is trying to be helpful. Sorry. Uh, you know, Jesus said that the Pharisees were pretending, pretending to be more zealous about keeping the law because they were trying to cover up their corruption and their lack of compassion. Putting on a big show. Look at we do this and this and this. We're we're 
We are very good at keeping even the smallest details of the law. And, you know, look at that. Look at that. But don't look at our corruption. Don't look at the fact that we really don't love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. You know, don't look at the fact that we lack compassion for our neighbor as ourselves. And Jesus came right out and he said, you are like whitewashed tombs. <laughs> Pretty on the outside, but disgusting on the inside. <laughs> you look fine on the outside, but you are full of bones and decaying corpses on the inside. Looking good on the outside, but in your heart, death and decay, disgustingness. And Jesus ended his denunciation, his condemnation of those Pharisees by accusing them of murdering the prophets that God had sent to Israel throughout history. Going back to that parable about the king who sent his servants to go and collect things collect the, what he was owed. Okay, you murdered the prophets and now you're gonna murder the son. Jesus knew that the Pharisees harbored the same hatred toward him that the people in the past had harbored against the prophets God had sent. And Jesus knew he was destined to be their next victim. Yeah, pride self-righteousness, always feeling that you are better than other people. Like you have, to, you have to work really hard to defend that. And it's not, it's not coming from the heart of God. It's not coming from the heart of love. This is coming from a whole other kingdom. And that kingdom is out to destroy anything that threatens them. And the Pharisees had this in their heart. Hey, let's pause there just for a moment and uh, just open it up. Any, any questions or comments right now? I'm interested. Who are Herodians? Are they related to King Herod? Yeah, well, th they're related. You know, remember, Herod had three sons, and they were all different Herods. You know, Herod Antipas and Philip Herod, the Tetrarch, and, you know, there were different ones. So, yeah, so they were they were related to these guys. But I think that some of the Herodians were more like they 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 were like secular Jewish people. Who um, who are, you know, they were into saying that they were Jewish and obeying the laws. But also they were more like Hellenistic at the same time, like thinking that they're very intellectual and very cultured. And um, so they, they also had a bone to pick with Jesus. They didn't like Jesus either because he sort of looked down on their way that they lived their lives as well because they were, they were sinners. Mary, who poured perfume on Jesus' feet? Mm -hmm. is, is she Lazarus' sister? Yes. Yes, that's the Mary. Mary they, are, they are not poor then. She could buy a very expensive perfume. Right. Right. I mean, they, they, they weren't poor. Um, who knows? It maybe, maybe, I mean, it makes no mention of their parents. It's like these two sisters and their brother living in the same house. And it seems as though that the maybe it was Martha, who is the oldest, and she might have inherited the property. So yeah, maybe they had a maybe they were a wealthy family, and maybe she had inherited this box of precious perfume or oil from maybe her mom or her dad. We don't know, but it, yeah, I would agree that they are, they are not poor. Actually, her action was very bizarre. 
Mm -hmm. Strange, but mm -hmm. um, you added explanation that she sac sacrificed her glory. Mm -hmm. That was her hair mm -hmm. because of her love for Jesus. Right. She humbled herself. Mm. So they can make sense. Yeah. You know, when you know women were supposed to keep their hair covered, right? <laughs> All the yeah. time because it was, you know, only your husband is really supposed to see your hair. It's like your it's like one of your most beautiful things that maybe only your husband or members of your family should see. And yet she takes off her head covering and exposes that. Like you said, it was shocking. Shocking to see this. And she's wiping his feet with her own hair and with this precious perfume. Like this might be something that maybe a woman would do for her husband that she really, really loved and honored. And she's doing it for Jesus. The when the scribe uh, brought the text thing to Jesus mm -hmm. to accuse him, mm -hmm. um, the Jesus said, uh, "The whose likeness and inscription does it have?" Right. And um, and he said, "Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's." And it reminds me the Rabbi Zacharias in his sermon. He said, mm -hmm. it, "This means that the whose likeness and image you made of, mm -hmm. you are his. And did you? Don't you? Didn't you? Don't you recognize who belongs to you?" Right. Yeah. Caesar's face was on the coin, so give give the coins to him. But God's image is on you. Yeah, you were made in his image and likeness. And like you said, yeah, so you should be rendering yourself to God. That's the spiritual thing to do. And yet those, sat, those Pharisees and Herodians, they were not willing to do that. They were living for themselves while saying, well, we're living for God, but they weren't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was very impressive then the question is included and in who you are in God, who mm -hmm. you are. This, yeah, is but they didn't understand that what really means that question is yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah, it's, I, I always had this thought, well, not always, but within the past few years when I've been thinking about this, you know, I, I would, when I was younger, I'd always read these speeches that Jesus was yelling at the Pharisees and calling them whitewashed sepulchers and things like this. And I thought, wow, Jesus really didn't like the Pharisees. He hated them. But now I think... Jesus loved them. Mm -hmm. Jesus loved them just as much as he loved anybody else. I mean, he hated the way that they thought and he hated the way that they lived because they were so blind. And, and they were the ones who, who were in charge of teaching the people. And, you know, th I think this is why Jesus was so hard on them was because they had such great power and influence over other people. And they were supposed to be teaching God's word to these people and teaching the Bible and what the truth is, and yet they weren't. And so they had this higher degree of accountability before God. But Jesus loved them. Jesus wanted them to become believers in him. Jesus wanted them to come to salvation, to, to be saved. And some of them did, some of them did, but as a, as a whole, as a group, they, had, they were blind and they had really hard hearts. And so I think this is why Jesus said some of the things that he said to them is because 
Jesus knows what to say to people that could possibly pierce through the hardness of their hearts and actually reach them with the truth. But, you know, so whenever Jesus speaks the truth, we have, we have two options, right? We can receive it or reject it. And those who received, their hearts were changed, like Nicodemus. Yes. Nicodemus, his heart was changed in others. But these other ones, they rejected it. When, as soon as they felt like that truth getting too close to them, boom, let's push it away. Let's get rid of Jesus. Let's reject his words and let's get rid of him. Mm. Yeah. And very understood. Mm. That, um, that is why she did like thing like mm -hmm. that. The, her hair washing his feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, like recognizing what's really valuable, what's really important. Yes. And she knew it. The Pharisees didn't. What was she filled with Holy Spirit at yeah, that I, time? I, I think the, you know, the Holy Spirit definitely used her. I think, you know, she was, she was hearing the words of the truth and she's responding to the truth. The Holy Spirit is moving upon her and she says, this is what's the right thing to do. And she goes and gets this alabaster box of ointment. And does this? I, yeah, I think she's moved by the Holy Spirit to do this. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I think Jesus talking uh, is not empty or meaningless because he considered or knew the heart of uh, the one who hears him. Mm -hmm. We can see that uh, from his talking to the rich young man. Mm. At that time, he quoted only uh, five commandments right. uh, between people and people mm -hmm. because he knew that uh, the young man lacked just one thing, love for God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, like what you're bringing out is like sometimes... The message is in what Jesus says, but it also could be in the, me the message could be in what Jesus does not say mm. that he yeah. could have said. Yeah. Yeah. So I was uh, so amazed at Jesus' mm -hmm. intellect. Yeah. He's God. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's, he's God, but he's a man too. Yeah, yeah. And like he says, I am only saying and doing what the father says and tells me what to do. So he's constantly receiving from God. And what comes out of his mouth is like the wisdom of God. It's like the God's knowledge. But he is open to that. And also, he's also, you know, grown up learning the scriptures. He has a command of this, what the Bible has to say. He's a very spiritual guy. <laughs> <laughs> something we can hope to be right yeah absolutely and he uh, emptied himself by mm. taking the form of a servant mm -hmm. being born in the likeness of man yes mm. yeah I think there is parallel we are made in God's image. Yeah. But Jesus, just backward. <laughs> mm. yeah. Like he's, he sets aside his deity. It'd be nice if we could set aside our humanity. <laughs> just live and just live, you know, with, with just Christ. The mm. Christ that's in us, the Holy Spirit that's in us. You're right, Anne. If we could just that's right. Uh, Helen uh, commented. When I uh, used the word intellect, mm -hmm. I hesitated mm -hmm. before uh, saying that, oh, mm -hmm. he's God. So how can I uh, talk about his mm. inter 
internet mm -hmm. or intelligence. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to use that because I was so mm -hmm. impressed mm -hmm. by his way of talking to the rich young men. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, I mean, we know from Luke chapter two that Jesus had to grow and learn just like any other human being. But he grew in wisdom and stature. Okay, wisdom, the wisdom part, wisdom, stature, and favor with God and men. Mm. Like he had to learn. He had to learn the Bible. He wasn't born knowing the Bible. Mm. Just like us, he had to learn it. So yeah, he did have an intellect. Mm. And God, he allowed God to use it. And he had great discernment. He, he, could, he had this spiritual discernment. Like he knew what was in the hearts of these people. And that's why he said some of the things that he, that he did. Mm. He knew exactly what to say. Unlike most of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's why God desire we also that to be conformed to the image of his son. Mm -hmm. Like Romans says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah. And, and Jesus, it's interesting. Here it is. It's just hours practically now before he is going to be arrested and he's going to be tried he's going to be crucified and he is still speaking very strongly preaching and teaching very strongly whoever is in front of him he's giving them the truth and jesus always speaks the truth in love but that's not how everyone receives it every single time like the pharisees the more he speaks the truth in love they hate him. They hate him. They don't like the truth because it's not their truth. It's God's truth. And so they're plotting, like, how can we get rid of him? Okay, let's move on here. Jesus is, goes into the temple and he's watching people put their offerings in the collection boxes in Jerusalem. And Jesus is not impressed by the offerings of the wealthy people who make a big show about how much they're putting in, you know, like take your big bag of coins and, you know, dump them out so they make a lot of noise. Or maybe if you keep them in the bag and you let them fall, like makes a big noise when they go into the box. He's not impressed by that. But he does notice when a poor widow dropped in her offering of two small coins. And Jesus used this as a lesson for his disciples, saying, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. Out of her poverty, she put in all she had to live on. And that is more. All she has is more. Jesus had spoken several times to his disciples about his upcoming death and resurrection, but he had said very little about his ascension to heaven and his second coming. But now that his death was near, Jesus begins speaking about these things, and he spoke two parables to prepare them to watch for his second coming, which he said would be at the end of the age. One parable was about five foolish virgins who missed parting a part of a wedding celebration because they did not have enough oil to keep their lamps burning. And Jesus contrasted these foolish virgins with five wise virgins who had plenty of oil. And Jesus' message was very clear. It's this, make sure you are ready for my return. He's talking about the future. Be ready because I will return. Be ready for my coming. In another parable, a landowner went on a long journey, leaving three of his servants different sums of money, or in the story they're called talents, to manage while he was away. Now, two of the servants multiplied their master's money through wise investments, but the third servant buried his money and failed to earn any return 
since he decided to play it safe, no risk. I'll just give him back what he gave to me. Well, the master was displeased with the third servant because he had been a poor manager of the money entrusted to him. This parable teaches that believers should be wise stewards of the gifts that we have been given by the Lord while we wait for his return. It's like, will we be called faithful or unfaithful? Like the Lord has given us time. He has given us spiritual gifts. He's even given us, you know, natural gifts and talents and blessings. And we're just asked to do whatever we can with whatever he has given to us for him, for his kingdom. Like the, 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 the widow, the widow had two coins. The widow had two coins. She, she, she didn't have a lot, but she did a lot with what she had. She gave it all. She invested it all into God's kingdom. She put it in the collection box. She would be considered to be faithful. She would be a wise steward. You know, instead of saving it, instead of saving it and just, oh, I don't know, I might need this. You know, she said, I'm going all in, like we talked about in the, in the baptism ceremony yesterday, going all in with Jesus, going all in. I'll just give you all of me like Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. And, and this is what God is saying. It's like, okay, be ready for my return. And, you know, give, give yourself. Make yourself a living sacrifice. Be faithful. These parables are part of a long eschatological, that's a big word, eschatological speech that Jesus gave called the Olivet Discourse. Okay, Olivet Discourse. It is a speech that he gave on the Mount of Olives. That's why it's Olivet Discourse, the speech on the Mount of Olives, which was just outside of Jerusalem. Eschatology is the study of the things that come at the end of time. So he is speaking about the end times. Jesus responded to two questions that were asked by his disciples during this speech on the Mount of Olives. Jesus had just declared that Jerusalem's beautiful temple would be destroyed. And the disciples, they wanted to know when this would happen. This was big news to them. Were they going to see this happen? Why would it happen? Oh my gosh. The disciples also wanted to know about the signs that would indicate the end of the age. Jesus, you say that the end is coming, that you are going to return, that we should be prepared. Well, how will we know when you are coming? We want to know so we can be prepared. So Jesus said, well, I'll answer these questions. So this discourse that he gives is about God's future program for the nation of Israel, okay? He's talking to his disciples as Jews. And so this, all of that discourse, he is talking about God's program for the nation of Israel. This is not the church that he's talking about. Jesus's prophecy about the temple was fulfilled in AD 70 when Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed by the Roman army. Okay, so this is where Jesus says the temple is going to be destroyed. It happened within their lifetimes for most of them if they hadn't been martyred. Okay, but then Jesus talks about a distant time period, about a future seven-year period of time called the Great Tribulation. And that ends or concludes with the second coming of Christ. Okay, so he's saying that before I come, there will be a seven-year period of great tribulation. He's answering their question, like, how will we know when you're coming? Well, when there's this huge tribulation, get ready. I'll be there soon. Matthew 24, verses 4 to 8, is speaking about the first half of the great tribulation. And then in verses 9 through 14, 
of Matthew 24, he speaks about the second half of this great tribulation period. And he's going into details. He's going into details because they've asked him, what are the signs of your coming? Then in verses 15 to 26, he gives even greater details about this tribulation period. Okay, so what Jesus is saying here in Matthew chapter 24, starting in verse 4 and going through 26, remember Matthew is writing to the Jewish people primarily. And you can see that, you know, when this period of time does come, in the future on the earth, you know, there are many Jewish people who are probably going to be reading Matthew's gospel and going like, oh, this is what Jesus said. This is what Jesus said. He must be coming soon. Because remember, the Jews, most of the Jews in the world right now do not believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They are not believers. And so when the church is taken out of the world into rapture, and the seven-year period begins, there's going to be a lot of Jews left behind here on the earth. But they are going to come to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And they can read Matthew 24, and they can read about the tribulation, and they can read about the coming of the Son of Man, and all these things. Jesus is describing it in detail. And it's going to happen just like what he spoke here in this Olivet Discourse. He's also speaking about false prophets that will come. And he also emphasized signs of his second coming there in verses 32 to 34. This is for Jewish people, when they read this, it has like a whole other dimension, a whole other meaning, especially for them because it's speaking directly to them, okay? Because Jesus, because God is still, still has his hand on the Jewish people. Remember when we, when we studied, oh, what was it we were studying? Was it when we were studying church uh, eschatology with Pastor Steve? He said, you know, where we are living now in the church age. We are living now in the church age. And it's like God has put like the nation of Israel on pause, on pause. You know, it's Israel is still there. Israel is still important. Israel is still God's chosen people. But right now, God is primarily dealing with the church here in the church age, the age of grace. But once the church is gone, God puts Israel back on play. Okay, and they become the main focus of what God is doing in the world. And that's going to be during this great tribulation period. And it's all outlined here for the Jews in Matthew chapter 24. <coughs> Excuse me. In Matthew 24, verse 35, Jesus declared that his words remain sure. Like, this will surely happen. And in Matthew 24, 36 to 44, Jesus says that no one knows the timing of these events and that those upon whom judgment is coming, they will be caught unaware. Okay, so the, the Jews don't know when Jesus is coming to take the church out of the world. They're, we're going to suddenly be gone. We're going to disappear. And then they're going to be like, oh, what's going on? And then maybe they'll start looking at the New Testament and they'll start looking at the book of Matthew, and they'll start going, oh, that, that one that we said was not the Messiah, maybe he is. Maybe he is, and maybe what he's, he said here in Matthew chapter 24, maybe that's what we see happening in the world. Maybe we should put our faith in him. Maybe those Christians were right. <laughs> So Jesus concluded his discourse with a picture of the judgment of the nations, which takes place at the end of the Great Tribulation. <sighs> Meanwhile, the religious leaders were gathering at the palace of the high priest to decide how to deal with Jesus. 
they discussed it and they decided not to kill Jesus until after the Passover celebration, since the crowds would not tolerate Jesus being harmed. Like Jesus was, maybe he's too popular for us to kill him before the Passover. It would just, it wouldn't go over well with the, with the people, with the public. This is what they decided. But then Judas showed up. And Judas, knowing that Jesus would eventually be arrested, decided to make some money from the situation. He went to the religious authorities and agreed to lead them to Jesus at an opportune time in exchange for 30 pieces of silver. Now, Judas later regretted his decision when Jesus was arrested and crucified. He tried to return the money, but the religious leaders refused to take it back. And Judas hanged himself in remorse. And the money was used to buy land for a cemetery for foreigners. And this is in Matthew 27, 1 through 10. Okay, so Judas was allowed, allowed Satan to use him. It says that, you know, Satan entered into him and used him. And he went and he betrayed Jesus. Again, Judas seemed to be more concerned about what was happening here and now in this material world than he was concerned about spiritual things. And he, really, and he again, did not understand what Jesus was all about. And he made he made bad decision. He made a bad decision. He lived in the consequences of that decision. And he ends up taking his own life, committing suicide as a result of this decision. Like he couldn't undo what he did. And so he killed himself. And <laughs> uh, that's where we end the slides for today on that kind of depressing note. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it's we have to, we have to. I, it's so important to walk by faith and not by sight. When we walk by sight, we just get caught up in the here and the now. We forget that there is this other eternal dimension, spiritual dimension. We just think that everything that we see and feel is everything that there is. And that's not true. That's not true. And like Judas made really disastrous, disastrous decisions because he was walking by sight. And he ended up killing himself and betraying God. Remember Jesus is God? He betrayed God for money. So... I'm so glad that you guys walk by faith and not by sight. <laughs> you love God. That's why you're here. So happy to have you here on a Monday morning here in October. Any comments about what we've discussed since the last break? What if Judas um, repented? Mm. And could he for receive forgive forgiven forgiveness forgiveness? I would think so. Mm. Yeah, I mean, is there any sin that is so great that God cannot forgive? I don't think so. The only the only sin that you know that that sends people to hell. If you want to, just like you say, like, what are the great commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Like there is the great sin. What is the great sin that sends people to hell? Is it murder? Is it adultery? Is it lying? No. Blaspheming Holy Spirit. Okay, and what is that? What is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Rejecting. Yeah, it's, re it's rejecting God. It's like not, it's unbelief. It's mm -hmm. unbelief. The Holy Spirit is saying to you, this is the truth. 
you need to repent and you need to receive Jesus Christ. And you say, I don't need that. I don't need that. I don't want that. I reject that. That's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I don't believe you. It's like, Holy Spirit, you're lying to me. And that's what sends people to hell is because they do not believe the truth. And so that's, that's that uh, when people say like, what is the worst sin you can commit? It's like unbelief, unbelief. That's why people go to hell. Because if you, if you, if you believe, remember repentance with belief, you can repent of your sin and believe in Jesus Christ for your salvation. You know, that we talked about that in relationship to baptism yesterday. And, you know, and God, God will forgive. God will forgive, but he can't forgive your unbelief. Mm. Because you don't want him. <laughs> I mean, by the time, but by the time you decide, like, oh, I want to repent, it's already too late. You're already in hell. You had your opportunity. The Holy Spirit was ministering truth to you throughout your entire life in different ways, trying to get you to see things from a spiritual point of view, but your need for a savior. And if you reject that in your lifetime with all the opportunities that God gives, he can't do more than that. I think his uh, Judas, his pride and remorse made him. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, he didn't repent. That's the thing. He didn't do it. And repentance, uh, there seems to be a process. So it's it's a very painful process. He mm -hmm. couldn't stand his mm -hmm. remorse. That was so great. Yeah, I mean, so, it's, humility is part of it, right? Yeah. And I heard that repentance is also gift. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, you have to you have to say, I receive your gift of forgiveness and I will repent. But some people think like I can't, I can't do that. Not recognizing God. Right. Some people are too proud to receive a gift. Mm. So it's sad. Hmm. Let's not harden our hearts. <laughs> like him. Right. Right. Then Christians say that uh, Christians live in a very convenient way when they sin, they just repent, and then things just uh, go as it is, but actually it's not. No. Repentance is not easy. No. When you mm -hmm. repent, mm -hmm. uh, we, uh, there is a pain. That's mm -hmm. a painful process mm -hmm. of repentance. Mm. We just simply, oh, oh, I repent, so everything is all right. The, uh, things are not like that. Mm. And besides, you know, there are so many things you know, that we have to repent, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Like Paul indicated that uh, as we grow in our faith, uh, there will be more to repent. Small things in our heart. Mm -hmm. Mm. We can sense, oh, this is something that I should repent. Right. You know, as the light gets brighter, <laughs> right. you, you see more. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. That you weren't aware of before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a it's actually a blessing that God doesn't show us everything at once. No. <laughs> we, we, would, we would be overwhelmed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we would be like Judas looking for a tree. 
like, oh, oh, I can't do this. You know, but a little bit of time, God sheds more light on us. And, you know, we embrace the truth and some, and it's painful at times, but it's also, it's, it's deliverance, right? It's right. deliverance. There's resurrection life waiting mm -hmm. for us on the other side of the cross. And new mercy, so we can. Amen. Mm. Amen. New mercy. Anybody else on this day off from <laughs> the government granted day off for Hungle Day? Mm. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess it must be time for people to start making lunch. <laughs> Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this, this class that we've had together. We thank you that you have opened the eyes of our hearts, that we mm -hmm. can see things by faith, that with the Holy Spirit inside of us and the word of God inside of us, our lives have been opened up to a new, a new reality, at least to us. So it's always been your reality, Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, the eternal reality of the truth and of and you who you are thank you that we get to be uh part of that as we are in christ and and christ is in us thank you that we've placed us in your body lord and that we are members one of another and that we can grow in grace together and encourage one another at times like this when we look into your word thank you lord Help us to like have uh, soft, tender hearts towards your truth, Lord. Amen. Amen. Yes. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you.